Siamo tutti. Please, please, can you close the, the door, please? Okay. No, yes, I think we, uh, we can start today STI seminar. Uh, today, uh, I am honored to, to present uh, Aaron Hernan from the University of, of Baroda. He will speak about digital holography quantitative phase imaging of macro and micro samples. Uh, mainly, this is the work that we are doing in, in the lab with uh, our step student, uh, Subat Utadilla. Uh, but before starting, I want to read uh, a little about uh, Aaron. Aaron received his PhD degree in applied physics from the University of Baroda, India in 2003. Uh, since uh, that time, until uh, 2008, he worked as a scientist at the Institute uh, for Plasma Research in India. Uh, he did postdoctoral work at the University of Stuart in, in Germany. Uh, he also joined the Applied Physics Department at the Ma Maharaja uh, University of Baroda in 2008. Presently, uh, he's working as a professor in the Department of Physics uh, at the Patel University. Uh, he has more than 120 publications, including peer reviewed uh, journals, conference proceedings, invited conference papers, and some patents. Also guided five uh, PhD students, four of them are almost finishing, uh, and complete a sponsored research project in the areas of holographic and holographic microscopy. Aaron is a member of the Optica, uh, former Optica Society of America and SPIE. Uh, his research interests include 3D uh, micro microscope for cell imaging and identification, bi biomedical optical system, digital holography, and optical instrumentation. And with this, uh, Aaron, you can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Humberto. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation, especially to present. The work, in fact, this is almost similar to the one I presented maybe last year. Uh, that was an online one. But so I thought that I'll add, uh, so that was mainly on microscopy. Of course, at the end, I'll present a little bit on microscopy too, because that is what we are focusing on, especially. Uh, but uh, I'll start with the uh, basic, it should have been like, diffuse and specular objects rather than micro and macro objects. So I'll start with uh, mainly with uh, the diffuse objects because that's what Subhash is also working on in MLAB mainly, uh, especially studying heat diffusion through phase samples and that is occluded by a diffuser and then try to image them and quantify them. So I'll present that work first and then I'll, at the end I'll talk a little bit about the microscopy part that we do also. So, uh, so these are so these are the, some of the areas in which we work on. So, as I told, I'll be mostly work, talking about uh, digital photography microscopy and interferometry. That's what we are doing this here also. And we also work on log coherence uh, interference imaging. Less a little bit on laser speckles than uh, optical tubes. Uh, uh, basically, low cost optical tubes and a uh, little bit on fringe projection and optical coherence tomography too, a little bit on. These are the areas, but I'll talk about the first two mainly, and if time permits, the, law, the optical traps with integrated microscopes, I'll just show some of the results. So most of the things will be the results. Uh, so I'll be presenting the methods we developed as well as the results we obtained and the applications we did with all these things. So basically, <coughs> your solution to your wave equation, that's your complex amplitude, uh, basically has got a scalar component, a polarization, and a phase. Of course, you can talk about coherence and all those things. I'm not going to talk about coherence in this thing. So any spatial map of your polarization or that E0 component to your uh, scalar amplitude or a phase is an image. 
So, but the issue with the light detectors is that it can detect only the absolute square of this complex amplitude. So that basically your polarization and your phase information are gone. You are basically going to detect your E zero square. That is your intensity error. So the phase. And the polarization needs to be indirectly measured, not directly measured. Uh, but the thing about phase, I will not talk about polarization. Of course, polarization can also be sensitive in many cases, but I will talk about phase only. So if you look at phase, so it basically depends upon the optical path or the optical distance uh, light beam travels. So that is your refractive index into the thickness. So that is your phase. And if you look at phase, you have your wavelength in the denominator. And let's say that your phase for a computer, your phase varies from 0 to 2 pi. So for a 0 to 2 pi variation, basically for from 0 to 2 pi, your n into z should vary from 0 to lambda only. So at a thickness, a thickness change of lambda basically gives you the whole range of intensity values if you're converting your phase into intensity. So even a small thickness change. Of lambda lambda, let's say that in visible regime, half uh, your wavelength is average wavelength is let's say 500 nanometers. So, 500 nanometers optical thickness will give you the full range. If you will convert that into intensity, it will give you the full range of intensity. So, that is high contrast, it will give you a high contrast image compared to your intensity images. Second thing is that if you have phase, of course, you can find your z. Z is your distance of propagation. So, once you have z, basically you are mapping the thickness profile of the sample. And that or you can also mapping the thickness thickness change of the sample. So that thickness change might be could be due to anything. Could be due to the deformation of the sample, could be due to some external stimulus. So that external stimulus could be heat, can be an electric field, could be a magnetic field, could be a chemical reaction, whatever it is. So you indirectly you should be able to measure finding the phase change, should be could be able to measure these external forces that changes the change in your path length. So that's the thing we apply in most of the cases. Okay. So as I told, your phase. Oh, so if I am fast, you can always uh, tell me. So my students usually say that I am usually fast. So if I am fast, you can <laughs> tell me that I am fast. So I will go slow. I think I hope the, my speed is okay. Okay. Uh, the thing I, as I told, basically you cannot directly. What you can say image you are okay before that uh, one of the things in fact i want to talk was basically like contrast contrast is basically like the intensity difference between your foreground and your background the issue is that so you are able to see me because uh, there is a probe that is your light beam that is carried off you of me and that is reaching the detector that is your eyes and your eyes can detect your intensity and you are able to distinguish my features because there is an change in the intensity the reflected light there is a change in the intensity of the reflected light so if there is if you, there is no change in the uh, uh, intensity of the reflected light basically you will be seeing only the edges of my body so it just basically scatters light so it doesn't reach you so it will become it will appear dark so that happens in the case of cells so white light is normally not absorbed if it is not absorbed only the edges scatter the light if it scatters the light the edges will appear darker the bulk of body appears will have the same intensity because it doesn't absorb light much so issue is that without chemical staining, you will not be able to see such objects. Whereas your face doesn't have a, such a problem because it depends only on the optical path length. If the optical path length changes, your face changes. If your face changes, that will lead to high contrast image. If you convert that to intensity, it will lead to high contrast images. So that is the advantage of using face. It gives you the optical thickness profile, plus it can also give you the, uh, it can give you high contrast images. But the issue is face is that it cannot directly be recorded. So what you do is that you superpose two beams, light beams. So okay, of course, these two light beams are derived from the same source to preserve the coherence condition. So usually we use laser sources because it is highly temporally coherent. So we use laser sources. You superpose one of the beams you call as your uh, reference wavefront. Reference wavefront is a plane wavefront. You know the face. Assume that you know the face of that wavefront. The object wavefront is the wavefront that interacts with the object that is either reflected or it is going through the object. And then it reaches your, but let's say your detector plane here. So that will lead to a interference pattern, something like this. If the object is not introduced in the path of the object group, you call this as a carrier fringe. So it carries information, but the information is not yet there in that interference pattern. So what do you do if you introduce the object, it gets modulated, your interference fringes get modulated. So what you can do is that 
you can do a demodulation. Demodulation basically means you remove the carrier frequency and get the information regarding the object alone. So that is basically done. For our, in our case, we record these interference patterns or holograms on a digital array. So you get a digital copy of the interference pattern. You do a, mostly in our cases, you do a Fourier transform, whether it is from a Kirchhoff integral or a Langlois spectral population <coughs> integral, you use a Fourier transform. Uh, what you can say, you pull out the, uh, the, what you can say, the carrier frequency and bring out the information due to the sample hello. So I'll come to that a little bit later. So your inter so this is your interference equation. When you superpose, this is your interference equation. That's basically three terms. These two terms are together. So this is your, let's say your incoherent, even if your source is incoherent. So this is like your incoherent addition. Plus you have your, uh, if you talk about your space in terms of your special frequencies, you have your side bags. So side bags basically contains your phase difference. The phase difference has got a phi O, that is, we call it as an object phase and the reference phase phi r. So the object, since you know about your reference, you theoretically speaking, you should be able to extract your phi o. And if you extract your phi o, plug in that equation for phase, you're basically going to get your optical path change. If you know the refractive index, you are exactly going to get the thickness profile of the sample. That's the basic idea. So holography is a method, in fact, so this is, this is basically interference microscopy. Of course, what you can do is that you can put a lens and make a, uh, what you can say, magnified image at the sensor, superpose, get the interference pattern. So you can say it's a interference microscope. Holography is nothing but an interferometric technique. What you record is basically you have, uh, uh, I'll just come to that, uh, how does it is done, how it is done. So it is a so Nobel Prize in 1971. So that is uh, invented in uh, 1948. Basically, holography means you record the whole field. Whole field in this case basically means the scanner amplitude as well as the phase. That is your holography. So the basic idea is something like this. So if you have, so if you think about the diffraction grading. So diffraction grading is basically nothing but, of course, it can be a phase grading or an amplitude. Let's talk about amplitude grading. If it's a diffraction grading. So it follows your diffraction equation. That is your E plus D sine theta is good and lambda. I hope it, it's fine. So basically, if you have two plane waves, you have two plane waves basically superposing at an angle. So you have your interference pattern. So this, this is your E plus D. I call it as your E plus D. That is basically, that depends upon this angle of incidence of between the two beams. So that is becomes sine theta. So I'm going to get only the first order that's equal to lambda. Lambda is the wavelength. Now, if your angle is fixed between the two plane wavefronts, so that, that means theta is fixed. So your angle is fixed, then your theta, theta is fixed. So it will lead to a particular E plus D. So you remove one of the beams. Let's say that you are removing this beam. Uh, and illuminating the grating with this beam, if there is only one direction in which can reflect the back is this direction because it has to preserve this equation. Of course, you can have a this thing in this direction. So let's not talk about it now. So that so basically your uh, grating preserves the angle information or the interference pattern preserves the angle information. Now instead of this thing, if you have a point source, I am not going to draw that thing. If you have a point source, so one of the beams is from a point source, so that is a spherical wavefront. So what you have is a diffraction grating with variable E plus D. So here the E plus D is less and here E plus D is or the grating element, E plus D is called the grating element. Grating element is lower here and grating element is higher here. So when you have a smaller grating element, you have a, if you look at the equation, you have a higher angle of diffraction. When you have a lower, uh, larger grating element, you will have a lower angle of diffraction. So basically what happens is that the beam from this point and this point converge at the point object. So basically now if you record a hologram or interference pattern, that is nothing but your hologram and re-illuminate it, remove the point source, re-illuminate with your reference wave, that is a plane wave, let's say. So you will see a point source in space. So now it has got the angular information plus the depth information. This is B. So it is basically, so when you re-illuminate, you get your point source here, back here, exactly at where it, it existed. So this you call as your virtual image. And of course, there you can scatter in the forward direction also. So that will also give you a real image. So you will have two images when you look at a hologram. One you call as a virtual image and other you call as a real image. But when you are looking through the hologram, if you have a point source, basically you have a lens here, right? So one of the images is formed here, one of the images is formed here. So if I am focusing on this image, 
this will become distorted. And if I am focusing on this image, this will become distorted. So when you are in a conventional holography, if you look through a hologram, you should be able to see two images, one virtual and one real. So, but if you are focusing on virtual image, real image is defocused. If you are focusing on real image, your virtual image will be defocused. Why I'm talking about point sources is that any object, as said, whether it's your face, whether it's, whether it's the chair, it is nothing but a collection of point sources. So each point on your object leads to one interference pattern. So think of them as independent interference patterns that is recorded. So each interference pattern will lead to a single point image. The collection of them is your object. So that is how your holography works. Simply, if you look at the grating picture of the grating, of course, mathematically, let's talk about it. So this is why I've shown, shown two point sources. You can extend it to n number of point sources. It will work exactly the same way. Okay, so this is your mathematical representation of your holography. You have your object and reference. So I've already, so this is nothing but your ultimately you'll have, you'll look at this equation. You have your, this you call as your background term plus your real image due to your real image and virtual image. And numerically the reconstruction basically means multiplying this hologram by the reference wave itself. Again, you multiply with the reference wave. So this is your reconstruction. Mathematically, this represents the reconstruction. You multiply the recorded hologram with the reference. So of course you should remember that your reference is not something like this. Okay. So this your reference is basically this one. This is a complex amplitude distribution. So you basically multiply with this term, you will arrive. You will arrive here. So basically, this one is the first term is the background term. Second term, if you look, is basically nothing but except this term is nothing but your object term itself. So except this one, this is your object term with a distortion factor. This is a complex form duet of your object term with a distortion factor. So basically, you are reconstructing your object term, and R square is nothing but a it's a it is nothing but a real number. So that is an amplified intensity amplified here, amplified virtual image. So that is this term. So illuminated, you have your undifferentiated reference beam, that is your this term, and this one is this term and this one is this one. Okay, so uh, your, uh, as I told, your formation is interference and your uh, uh, reconstruction is uh, diffraction. So I'll <coughs> keep this thing. Okay, so there are a few numerical methods by which your holograms can be reconstructed. In fact, so all depends upon your scalar diffraction theory. So there are mainly two approaches. One either it's your frontal Kirchhoff approach, and the other one is your angular spectrum approach. The main difference between them is that in frontal Kirchhoff in the uh, approach, you have uh, basically assume a paraxial propagation. In angular spectrum approach, you don't assume a paraxial propagation. In frontal Kirchhoff integral, you are basically propagating space itself, whereas in angular spectrum approach, you are propagating your frequency spectrum to wherever you want, and then taking an inverse Fourier transform to convert that back to into space. So. Frontal Kirchhoff, uh, what you can say, approach is mainly used for larger objects. So basically, and your distance of propagation is very large compared to your size of the hologram. And for us, for example, we are recording on a on a digital array. The digital array is of the dimension of few millimeters to maybe like a centimeter or so. And the distance of propagation is in bodies like maybe like few uh, tens of centimeters. So that is much larger compared to the size of the hologram. So basically, you can apply, apply your paraxial approximation. That is also called as your frontal approximation. And in, you can reduce your uh, whole uh, diffraction integral into ultimately the re whole numerical reconstruction into nothing but a frontal transform. So it's nothing but a Fourier transform of your uh, hologram multiplied with the reference and a spherical factor. So that is your reconstruction. Now, if you look at this equation, there is a D here. Forget about resolution. So this is there is a D here. So if you look at this image, so this D is nothing but the distance of propagation. So once you record the hologram, and then you in, when you numerically reconstruct it, if you change D, you are basically going to focus onto different planes. So that is called as your numerical focus. So once you record a hologram, after recording, you can focus onto different legs. So basically, if you have a volume image from a volume, you can focus on the different layers of the volume. But only issue is that it also depends upon your coherence of your laser source. So let's not get into that. Okay, 
so once you have the uh, once you have the complex amplitude reconstruct complex amplitude so you can have the intensity intensity is nothing but absolute square of that complex amplitude phase is nothing but your uh, tan inverse of your imaginary part by real part so you'll get both your complex amplitude can be converted to intensity or, or as well as phase so numerically you are basically extracting both intensity as well as phase so now let's go so that's the basic theoretical aspects so now go to let's do um, i'll present some of the results we got so that might be interesting i don't know but i had to introduce some of the theoretical part right, because before showing the results to see what is numerical focusing you should know how it is done otherwise you cannot appreciate how it is done uh, what it is okay okay so this is basically the hologram of a diffuse object diffuse object means likely anything that scatters in every direction a rough object so since the object is rough basically what happens is that the object wave front has got random phase changes if it has got random phase changes the interference pattern that results will be random so if you look closely here not here these are not interference fringes these the inside so this is these are the interference fringes you can see the interference fringes they are randomly oriented and it should be randomly oriented because your object is rough okay so this is the basic setup you can for reflection mode you can do so the laser so from the same laser basically you illuminate one of the beams illuminate the sample or the object and the other is act as a reference of course it's a plane wave front so you get this interference pattern <coughs> so this is basically the interference pattern of a Fine. It's not working. In fact, I want to show the numerical focusing part. I don't know the video is not working. Anymore. No, it's not working. So basically, okay. Basically, what happens is that. So this point was kept approximately 1.2 meter from the hologram detector. So basically, to get the perfect image, you have to propagate it 1.2 meters. So any 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 distance before 1.2 meters, it will be out of focus. Any distance after 1.2 meters, it will be out of focus. So basically, when you propagate it at 1.8 meters, in fact, so that's what I want to show. At 1.8 meters, you will have the perfect focused image of the point. But it's not working anyway. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay, uh, there are some issues with. I think this issue with the um, version of the PowerPoint. Anyway, doesn't matter. Okay, so now, uh, so that that is basically the numerical focusing. That won't give you anything as such. But the thing is that how can how can you apply uh, holography, basically? Let's say for deformation measurement. In conventional holography, when the photographic plates were used, what you basically done is that you have an object, you record a hologram of the object, you have a deformed version of the object, you record the hologram of the object on the same photographic plate. So now you have, let's say, two interference fringes of the same object. When you illuminate with a laser, it will basically propagate in two directions, initial state of the object and the final state of the object. And since you are using a laser beam, both will be coherent. And these two object beams will ultimately interfere and it will give you a set of interference fringes. They are called as your holographic fringes. Now your holographic fringes is directly related to the deformation. So this basically shows that. So you have basically a load is applied on a coil. A load is applied. So this is before applying the load, this is after applying the load. So before and after applying the load, of course, the face, if you look at the face, it is random and it should be random. It is random because okay. I think I forgot to tell one of the things. Okay, before this thing, yeah, here rather than the video, rather than the video, if you look. So I told you about three terms, right? So this is the undefracted term. This is the virtual image that is in focus, and this is the real image that is out of focus. You will always get three terms. And if you look at the face here, it is random. It is random because your point is random. Your roughness is random. So you are going to bound to get a random face change. But when you do a phase subtraction, when you phase, do a phase subtraction, the thing is that I am looking at the same object. Only thing is that it's slightly deformed, slightly tilted in this case. So the randomness remains same. So when you subtract the phase from first, first uh, state, from the second state, basically the randomness goes off 
that will bring out only the phase due to the deformation around. So that's it. So then what you get? So this is called also called as your wrapped phase because it's always between zero and two pi. Your computer can recognize only between zero and two pi. So your phase is between zero and two pi. What do you do? Apply an unwrapping algorithm. There are n number of different unwrapping algorithms. Unwrapping algorithm and convert it to a continuous phase. So this is the continuous phase. And so this is the deformation that is along the x and y directions. You can see it's almost like they are measuring like to the nanometer level deformation. So if you if, if you uh, keep the background as the noise, so it gives it gives me around 10 to 15 nanometer as the resolution in the case of rough uh, samples. Okay, so this is the I don't know whether the video will work or not. So not work. None of the videos will work. Right? Doubt it. Because of the computer. Mm -hmm. Think so. So this I basically wanted to show the loading of a cantilever. So if you load the cantilever, in fact, of course, you can see it. Yes, okay, now it's loading. It takes a long time. To, uh, anyway, so basically what happens, so this is basically clamped at one end and the free end is loaded at the free end. And basically, and then you record the holograms as a function of the loading. So you can see it here. So this is basically the bending of the cantilever. Of course, you can use it to find the Young's models and all those things. So of course, we didn't do that. It's just to demonstrate. This is a complex deformation machine. I'll skip that thing. Uh, I'll skip this thing also. Okay. One of the things, in fact, I would like to say is this is about uh, the measurement of diffusion, uh, two binary liquids diffusing into each other. So basically, you have a basically your distribution is given by an error function in this case, your concentration is given by an error function, and uh, the diffusion process is given by your fixed second law. So in this case, what happened is that instead of your plain reference wavefront, we are using a uh, reference that is exactly located. So this is my object here, exactly located at the plane of the object. So this beam is given by an expanding wavefront. So this is an, uh, nothing but erased by k lambda into, uh, uh, into, into x square plus y square. So this is nothing but an expanding spherical wavefront. If your reference, instead of the reference, so this is your reference wave, right? You plug it in here, it basically cancels out this exponential term. If it cancels out this exponential term, your reconstruction process is nothing but if you record the hologram, take a Fourier transform. If you look at if you look here, so this cancels out either the whatever remaining is nothing but Fourier transform of your hologram. So ultimately, what you do is that you basically record the hologram with a point source at the object plane itself as the reference. You take record the hologram, take a Fourier transform of the hologram, it directly gives you the reconstruction, the phase as well as the amplitude. Now, this is good for real time applications because you just need to compute a single hologram earlier, basically a hologram, and you need to supply your propagation distance, etc. So it takes time. So this is just a single Fourier transform gives you the uh, reconstruction, the phase and amplitude. And basically, you do a phase subtraction, you get beautiful phase uh, maps, and from the phase maps, you can compute the diffusion coefficient. And of course, you can also monitor the process of diffusion. So this is anyway for the same thing. So this is mechanical loading. So this was a key basically. So basically mechanically again, it's like a cantilever loaded at one of the one end. So <laughs> the loading, so the deformation is like, the maximum is like two to three micrometers. Why I'm showing you this is that, so this is mechanical loading. The same thing can be done with, so this for a cantilever, I'll skip this thing, the same thing. The same thing can be done with a, for a thermal loading also. So this is again a cantilever, thermally loaded at one of the ends. So basically, there is a thermal expansion, and this is and capturing we are capturing the thermal expansion, and due to thermal expansion, it deforms, and this deformation can be captured with the nanometer scale uh, deflection measurements. Okay, so this is the same setup. So what I where we used it is that's why I want to come there. So this is, of course, for a temperature distribution. So this is an axisymmetrical temperature distribution, a flame. It could be a candle flame. It could be any of burners or anything. Since it is axisymmetrical, symmetrical, of course, you can use an Abel inversion and find the local refractive index values. You just need, you have a phase information. And if you have a phase info, that's nothing but a code integrated value. You do an Abel inversion, you are basically going to get your local refractive index values. So that is there. So the basically, so this is the same thing applied to a glass slab. 
that was a flame, this is a glass slab. Basically, I want to show is this one. So we had an object. So there is a we call it as a defect. It's not a defect. Basically, we drilled something into that. So it's like a hole in the object. That's a, a, a plexi acrylic. So we'll drill, drill a hole into that thing. So that is basically you have a uniform object and there's a non-union non or inhomogeneity in between. So you apply a thermal load. Basically, the diffusion, heat diffusion in different parts will be different. And since your face can capture, uh, okay, one more thing. So as the heat diffuse, diffuses into, let's say, dielectric medium, you have a time as well as space varying refractive index distribution. So if you have a time and space varying refractive index distribution, your phase of the object being passing through, the sample will also change with time, especially as well as with time. So that is what is basically captured here. So the heat is diffusing. So without the defect, it looks something like this, of course, uniform. And with the defect, of course, it becomes visible as thermal loading is increased. Thermal load is increased. And what we can do is that we can, of course, extract uh, the face information and subtract out the linear or the nonlinear face itself and bring out the defect itself. And of course, on that defect also, we can do an assuming it to be symmetric, we can you do a Abel inversion and get the local refractive index values. So we did that for uh, uh, this is for a uh, heating rod in air, so we can find uh, uh, refractive index changes. The main idea is that if you look at that white rectangle, right? So there was a, a thin uh, cover slide kept there. So the heat diffusion in the cover slide is different from that in there. So it becomes visible. I hope it is visible. Yeah. So that 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 um, that that triangular shape is that cover slide. <coughs> Only issue is that <coughs> so if you have an opaque object, of course, the light doesn't pass through that. So we were thinking like, can we uh, basically image uh, something that is uh, below, be, uh, behind or below that opaque object. So what we did is we used a steel ruler and then we had a small cellophane tape stuck on the other side. And we were imaging the portion that is just above the uh, opaque object. And uh, we basically heated it from uh, below. So basically the air around, of course, you need to, uh, ideally we found that you have to confine and all those things, but we got some results. So basically you are uh, imaging the uh, air surrounding the opaque uh, object above, in fact. So basically due to the difference in the heat diffusion through the sample, so that becomes visible if you look at the face maps. So one on the left is without any cellophane tape. On the right, the face map is basically with the cellophane tape. And of course, I can subtract the first one from the second one and get uh, approximate position of that different here, somewhere here. So that is with an opaque object. Right? It's not a translucent one. Okay, so this is one of the work in fact Subhash is doing here. Now we what we did is basically like, so if you have a, as I told, if you have a face object and you are thermally loading it, so it is basically going to result in a spatio-temporally evolving phase distribution. So from the face, we can extract multiple features. And from with those features, we can train a machine learning algorithm. And from that model, we can identify the thickness of the sample. So that is the basic thing. So these are basically for five different thicknesses. So from, uh, this is again acrylic. So from 2.5 to 12.5, so then we heated it. So the protocol remained the same for heating the, all the samples. And these are the special temporally evolving phase distribution. And from this thing, we extracted multiple features like maximum, the standard deviation rate of change and the fitting parameters. And we, I fitted it with a quadratic uh, or second degree polynomial. So I uh, and extracted all those parameters and uh, trained a linear regression uh, machine learning model. And uh, we found that the, the error is approximately 200 microns. So we were using 2.5 uh, uh, millimeter thickness. So we are getting around uh, 200 micron error in the measurement. And we also tested with the second set. So that gave us around approximately like uh, 0.5 millimeter error in that. So we are still working on that thing. Hope uh, before leaving, it should be done. So this is the result. In fact, I put just before coming here. In fact, uh, 
instead of uh, heating with a what you can say heating rod a heating platform you could also use a laser beam to uh, heat the sample so you had uh, so the setup is something like this i didn't get time to make a good uh, figure here so this is my excitation beam so the excitation beam is hitting the sample so there is an absorption here so there is a uh, what you can say i'll not say uh, thermal lensing it's like more like a, what's that other term thermal stress no 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 what is that yeah photothermal uh, effect so basically what happens there is a change in the it absorbs light basically it heats up it heats up the refractive index changes if the refractive index changes so you can see so that's what's shown here and basically what you are doing is that you are basically scanning this lens so first it will hit this layer this layer etc so if you look so when i plot the maximum of the phase you can see the two layers of course i'm still working on what are the features to extract to identify the layers so that will take some time anyway so he is anyway carrying on with those experiments so we are getting some good results here okay so let me go ahead so this is for your the diffuse objects so i'll talk a little bit about microscope if you are bored then i can find it up or i will take and go ahead maybe 10 more minutes 15 minutes okay okay so uh, so in fact this is this is one of the areas in we 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 work very what you can say we do, do a lot of work on uh, ultimately the end uh, aim is to have a small handheld microscope that can be taken to the field to test different diseases so how many diseases we can we don't know now but we get some uh, good results in malaria thalassemia and sickle cell disease uh, in the classification process so this similar to the setup i have described so far only thing is that of course this can be done with and without lens also I'll, at the end i'll show with the one without the lens also so you can have a lensless imaging also in hologram so so far whatever i have shown is without a lens only there is there is no lens involved but in this case i am introducing we are introducing a lens so you have an object micro object you have a magnified image and here you keep your digital array and your reference beam inter basically interferes and you have your interference pattern so this so this is here so this is your uh, reference beam the intensity its phase object beam intensity and phase the superpose and you get your fringes and of course you have your carrier fringes it gets modulated you need a modulation we already talked about how you beam modulate of course there's a slightly different method here why i am much interested in this because not just in india all, all over the world we have diseases especially that can be uh, that manifest itself in uh, blood cells red blood cells mainly so malaria of course your uh, your parasites goes into the red blood cells uh, your uh, sickle cell anemia your density changes and uh, the shape changes need not in the trait it need not change into your crescent shape and uh, thalassemia also the density of the cells changes compared to a normal healthy cell because it, its flexibility decreases so it cannot flow free so basically you have the flexibility of your cell determines how far the red blood cell can go and deliver oxygen so that is very important for your uh, health of a person to see whether these <coughs> conditions exist in, uh, exist in them or not okay the first malaria is a disease and the other two are hereditary conditions okay so normally uh, the uh, classification or identification is by chemically treating the sample for example in the case of malaria you basically do a gymsa stain uh, so that this chemical basically gets attached to only the malarial, malarial parasite, parasites so your blood cells are like doesn't have anything it's just a, just a uh, blood cell means red blood cells just a jelly it doesn't have a nucleus and this gymsa stain only gets attached to rna or dna so you you don't need a nucleus for that but your uh, malarial parasite has got uh, rna and dna and it gets attached to only those uh, uh, parasites and it changes its uh, so when you look under a microscope those regions will appear at a different color means dark so and uh, usually a microscope is basically looks under a microscope and identifies the regions of uh, different uh, change in the color and uh, identify the level of malaria that's a normal case that is followed in for uh, malaria detection under a microscope normally and of course you can have a 
can of course have a flow cytometer and uh, measure different parameters of the cell and use it for the classification of the cell also. But of course, your flow cytometers are costly, bulky also. And at the end, did you require a technician? Of course, you don't need it. Now we can do a machine learning machine training and do that thing. That's a different issue. But it's still bulky and kept carrying into field is different. So we thought that can we have a microscope uh, that can give extract these parameters and use it to classify the disease or identify the disease, classify the cells and identify the disease. So your normal uh, holographic microscopes are looks what you uh, you were Max Center geometry. Max Center geometry basically, of course, it's an interference uh, microscope, right? So basically, you should have two beams. One is your reference beam. Uh, one is your reference beam that is not modulated, or the other one goes through the object. They interfere. I don't know whether you can see the interference fringes here. Also. So these are the, the this is a blood cell over which you you have your interference fringes. The interference fringes get modulated because there is a change in thickness. And uh, of course, what we do is that we do a 3D printing of the structure and put in the um, optical elements and it becomes like a portable microscope. Of course, this is not portable. I'll come to the portable at the end. So still it is but So, but this, this one, this configuration gives you the best images as such because your reference beam is entirely going along a different direction and doesn't have any object information. But the issue is that it is still bulky. You need multiple optical elements. And... Uh, uh, you basically we are coupling a laser from outside, so it, it is pretty difficult to carry out. Of course, it's costly. Multiple optical elements means. Uh, so this we already discussed. Only difference here is that from the diffuse object is that we are using analog spectrum instead of Kronecker uh, Kirchhoff integral. So in the analog spectrum, if you look, if you, if your image is at the so your hologram is at the image plane of the lens, your distance of propagation becomes zero. So your whole reconstruction numerical processing becomes nothing but the Fourier analysis of the interference fringes. Fourier analysis basically means interference, take a Fourier transform, put a filter, uh, get it to the center to uh, negate the carrier frequency, do an inverse Fourier transform, that's it, mathematically. Okay, so again, you can do numerical focusing, etc. So that's the video. So what we do is that we record two holograms, one with the blood cells in the field of view, one without. So the, uh, the optics remain same between the exposures and you do a phase subtraction. So whatever is the uh, phase due to maybe a defocusing, maybe aberrations, most of them get canceled out and it will bring only the sample phase information. And from the sample phase information, once you know the refractive index, you can convert that into thickness information. So this is basically a 3D profile. Oh, I will not say 3D profile. 3D profile requires a tomography. So it's a thickness profile of a red blood cell. Once you have the thickness profile, you can have a larger number of cell features that could be extracted. So basically, I bring it into three categories. One is from a single hologram that I call as the physical parameters. You can call it any other name also. The second one I call as the mechanical parameters because it is from a time series of holograms. So that will give you the fluctuation profile of the cell. And the last one I call as the optical parameters. It is not from a time series. It is by illuminating the cell at different angles. So that is from the tomography of the cell. Okay, so initially we worked on embryonic stem cells. I'll skip all these things. And we also tried to include a microfluid into this device. It worked really well. I'll skip that thing. Okay, I'll come to this one because this is the basically the compact device I was talking about. <clears throat> the only issue with your Maxander device is that you have two beams separately, <coughs> so it becomes bulky. So what we can do is that instead of using a two beam splitters and all those beam steering components, we can just use a uh, glass plate. So glass plate, you have reflection from the front and the back surface. So you have two beams directly from a single glass plate. So these two interfere. And if, if the thickness of the glass plate is large enough, so you have, otherwise what you are getting is what we call as a shearing interference pattern. You will have an object over its image. But if you increase the thickness, these two separate out and then it will lead to holograms. So what you get is something like this. So these are the holograms. Main thing is that now we are able to measure the fluctuation of a red blood cell. That's the fluctuation profile of a red blood cell. An oscillating red blood cell oscillating basically because we have taken it out, put it on a cover slide. So you have a concentration as well as a thermal gradient. That is why it is oscillating. So that oscillation amplitude is of the order of few nanometers to few tens of nanometers. 
So normally the Max Zander setup I showed you, it has got a temporal resolution of maybe like few nanometers, maybe like three, four, five nanometers. This one we can get sub nanometer, maybe like almost up to 0.5 nanometer over a period of two minutes. We get so basically this is ideal to measure this fluctuation properly. And this is a glioblastoma cell that is oscillating at it's not shown anyway. Oscillating anyway. So this is the stability I'm talking about. Okay, so then we thought that can we have it? <coughs> Convert that into a very compact device. So, uh, so this is the device. It's, it's a handheld device, almost a, maybe like a seven centimeters axis <laughs> nine by seven by three. So instead of a normal objective lens, we are using uh, lenses that is from uh, optical pickup units. The advantage of using OPU is that it is already on a voice coil. So by applying a current, you can move the lens. So you can get multiple field of views. Plus, you can also apply a current and focus also. So you don't need a separate focusing mechanism. So your uh, uh, your device becomes very compact, and it looks something like this. So it looks something like this. So you have your laser. So this is a fifty cent diode laser, and uh, you have a sharing plate, and you have an optical pickup unit here. So the lens is on this optical pickup unit, and then you have cell your uh, uh, power sources for your uh, your laser as well as your uh, optical pickup unit. Of course, you can convert a normal clinical microscope also into a 3D one. So just uh, we add a module that can be directly you just remove the top portion and insert that thing that will be converted. This is what I was talking to you about. Convert that into a you don't have to do anything. Just put it plug it in so it will work as a 3D microscope. Okay, now the classification part. So as I told, we get multiple sample features. Now I, we have to use these sample features. So just extracting the sample features does, is, is not enough. So this is in the case of a, uh, in the case of healthy as well as and sickle cell positive cells. So we had uh, we had collected blood from sickle cell positive tested already tested positive patients as well as healthy patients. And these are the distributions. So let's not look at the distributions. Of course, they look different. That means, and we did some statistical analysis and found that the distributions are from two different classes. So, of course, that can be used for classification. That's a basic idea. And we trained basically some machine learning algorithms, and we were able to get almost this is for sickle cell disease. We were able to get uh, almost like 98% accuracy so far. Of course. And let me tell you, this is with only six or seven samples as such, because getting the samples is also difficult. Even in India, getting the samples is difficult. So we are still collecting the samples and uh, recording the holograms and trying to improve the results. And again, with malaria, the same thing. We got around 96% uh, accuracy with malaria. And then one of our students, in fact, he designed a, a small app in for a browser-based app. So basically, this can be connected to your uh, this, this microscope I drew, uh, showed you. So, and these holograms can be uploaded and the whole process takes place in an offsite piece and the result is sent back to the user. Okay, this is the tomography, but I'll not go much into this thing. So, it's the same setup can be used to have a tomography of the slicing of the cells also. Okay, this is something we are working now, basically on integrating an optical trap with a holographic microscope. So that optical trap is again, you basically using an op uh, optical pickup unit from a lens, it need not be from optical pickup unit as but we used an optical pickup unit, the lens and the same laser, so it can trap a blood cell easily. Uh, then we integrated a holographic uh, microscope into that one. So it's a compact device and it can give multiple features. This video is not working, I don't know. So that's the trap, that's working of the trap. So let's go ahead. So we did some, again, some classifications, including the Brownian motion of the sample, plus the uh, face images of the sample. So this is the optical trap, the work of the face images of the optical, uh, face reconstruction from the optical trap. So that's a blood cell. The one on the bottom is a blood cell, and the, on top is like a six micron microsphere, six micrometer diameter microsphere. 
then then we combined we are getting like 90 percent accuracy this is nothing 90 percent accuracy i need at least 99 to be to, uh, sure about that but this is what we are getting present as such okay so uh, we applied it of course it's not only for the biological samples we are applying it to so we can use it for let's say for example semiconductor inspection of semiconductor wafers the high profile of the semiconductor wafers etc so this is one of the devices in fact we designed and uh, the company in korea has basically is manufacturing this thing okay th then i told about the lensless thing na? so i'll wind it up after this one so lensless thing it's not necessary that you should have a lens in holography because you have the uh, uh what you can see you have numerical focusing so basic thing is that so you have two beams here so there's a sample here there is no lens so you have holograms on the sensor now what you do is that so once you have the holograms what you can do is that you can numerically focus back onto the best focus plane. Of course, you can use auto focusing algorithms also. We use auto focusing algorithms and then extract the face and get the 3D profile. So, the advantage here is that your field of view, your field of view is decided by your lens in the case of a lens. For example, if you are using a lens of 40x magnification, your field of view is approximately 250 by 250 microns. But here, if you look, you are getting field of views up to almost 5 millimeter by 5 millimeter. So, you have larger field of view. Only issue is that. Your, uh, your your size of the object that you can image is limited by the size of the pixel. Of course, you can do a sub-pixel scanning in that case to convert your pixels into small size that you can do. But this is one of the things, in fact, we would like to do, in fact, later on. But only, other issue is that in your uh, <clears throat> lensless imaging, you need to propagate. So propagation means loss in resolution. You are usually losing as for you, when you propagate, you are losing higher special frequency. So there, there is a loss in resolution. So only issue with lensless case is a loss in resolution. Of course, people have done with the object very close to the sensor. So you are getting approximately numerical apertures of approximately 0. 0.6. So we are getting numerical aperture approximately 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3, not more than that. So that means resolution is around 0. 0.2, 2 microns. Otherwise, you get hey, I'm done. So uh, done. So this is one of the things we are pursuing. Uh, to convert that into a compact device. Okay, so what I'll do is that I'll wind it up in there. So these are the things we would like to do, especially in the thermal lensing. So we would like to apply. So not that's what he is doing now. He, whether we can use a laser for photothermal excitation and whether we can slice it or not, just by single beam, whether you can do it. Then uh, we would like to do it for uh, biosamples. Basic idea was to use this thermal loading for biosamples, such as, for example, skin. Can we just apply maybe two or three Kelvin change and find what is below or not? That's one of the things. And for DHM, uh, we basically are now trying to put some external stimulus, maybe an electric field, maybe even a. In fact, I want to show that result. I couldn't find it. Uh, for example, thermal lensing. So we basically shine a focused laser beam the cell, the, the blood cell expands. In fact, we have seen that. So whether we can use it for accurate, uh, accurate classification of the cells. And of course, at the end is like a low cost field deployable DHM. So that we already have, but we now basically have to train it for multiple diseases. So that requires uh, a lot of work to collect uh, samples, to record holograms, and as well as to uh, basically train the algorithm to classify the cells. So that's the end day. Okay, so of course, this is not the work of a single group. There are a lot of other groups also involved. So of course, without acknowledging them, it is, I should not wind anything up. So these are the, my collaborators. And of course, now, thanks in fact for inviting me, Maria, Professor Nimela for inviting me. So we could uh, really good do some uh, good work and I hope to continue that. And, so, and thank you for this, uh, what you can say, the warm welcome and all the support you gave me for during the visit. And with that, of course, I'll wind it up and I can have questions. But uh, I tried to put in as much as possible. <laughs> I, I would like to add a acknowledgement to the FLAP because they- Yeah, prepared. yeah, of course, FLAP. Yeah, they gave us a lot of samples and what in whichever way we wanted, yeah, absolutely. Yes, Carlo Fonda and Enrique. We will have to, uh, okay, we have uh, time for question now. Uh, let's we start with the uh, uh, audience here, and then uh, we have online, yeah, yeah, we online also questions. Uh, okay. For online questions, uh, you can open your microphone and uh, directly ask. 
Yes. Uh, I, I will give you a question. I know but yeah, yeah, yeah. something that when you trap uh, blood cells, uh, you know they, they can be affected by the Absolutely. laser beam. Yeah, yeah. This is an uh, important issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which kind of laser and uh, how do you manage or the power, the wavelength, not to damage the cells? Yes, cell the, the one we, we are using is 650 nanometers. It's from the OP unit. Of course, it can be absorbed a lot. But what we did is that we trapped it and the time we try to see how the profile changes. There wasn't much change in the profile as such. And the power was like 40 milliwatts in the last we used, was like 40 milliwatts, so not much. The wavelength and the power. Yeah, yeah 650 profile. nanometers and 40 milliwatts, yeah. It worked, but I'm still not satisfied with the results. Question? It can be liquid, yes. Yeah, because I was thinking, can you apply this technology for contamination? Um, to find this a clean liquid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It can be done. So we were thinking something in the similar line, like uh, for example, suppose it's equivalent to measuring the concentration ultimately. So your contamination changes something, some parameter. So we were thinking like uh, illuminating a liquid with a laser, an excitation laser, and then a probe laser will record the holograms. And there is, there are phase changes. In fact, it's one of the ones I didn't mention because I was thinking like, in fact, he told me to mention that thing here, but I didn't mention. So we were able to measure very, very small concentration changes. Mm -hmm. So that can be used for uh, measurement. Yeah, it has some potentiality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because it's very up to date. Yeah. It's very fashionable. Because, because we can go down in the in the absorption measurement, when you compare with the conventional spectrophotometers, we can measure down. It's something we did also with Subat here. Um, there is a paper uh, under review and applied physics related in this topic. Yeah. Yeah. Not only really solid, but solid. Liquid, yeah, definitely can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah can. in fact, that is one of the things we are going to do also. Like, for example, if you have liquid layers also, mm -hmm. so we are thinking like you will illuminate with uh, at different positions and whether we can distinguish between the layers or change in the concentration. Yeah, I was thinking in drinking water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, it could be. Yeah, yeah, it could be done. And it could be done even with, a, for example, we are thinking also like a, like a microfluidic uh, chamber and then illuminate it. So it's already contained there. So something like that. I think Andres also has a question. Uh, yes. Well, you mentioned digital uh, holography. So it means that you're using remote devices to record photos. So, one question is how important is um, the coherency? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in principle, suppose that you have a, a sensor sensitive enough to detect photo by photo. Can you uh, construct, reconstruct the holography by accumulating individual photons? If your uh, if your uh, object is uh, static, yeah, mm -hmm. should be. We did something on low light uh, holography also, but that is if your object is dynamic. I doubt it. It's possible, I don't know, because your, your object is changing in between uh, two exposures. But the technique for, for single, single photo counting is... Yeah, what that is saying, so by accumulating the photos, so it will be tough to answer, that's what yes. I'm saying. And the coherence, yeah, of yes. course it is important. As I told, I am using, we are using lasers. The one issue with low coherence source, especially low, let's say you are using an LED. The issue is that you are, uh, <clears throat> you will get your field of view. Your field of view is the area in which you have your interference fringes. Mm -hmm. So if you have two wavefronts interfering, basically, the only till the region up to which your uh, path length difference is less than the coherence length, you will have your interference fringes, otherwise you don't. So it becomes important. Of course, what you can do is that you can reduce the angle. But reducing the angle, our reconstruction, as I told, in this case, of course, you can go for maybe like inverse problem approach and all those things yeah. to do that thing. But they are basically iterative, not deterministic. The phase year reconstructions are using deterministic algorithms. So that's a unique thing. Any iterative algorithm is going to give you a solution. It may not be the ultimate solution. So of course, people work on uh, inline setup with a sorry, with an iterative uh, reconstruction approach also. It works. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But if you are using a low coherent source and if your angle is very small, your the density of your interference fringes is very low. So our case it won't work because we are putting we are making a we are taking a Fourier transform, putting a filter, 
can't put the filter if your sidelines are not separated. So that becomes difficult. Uh, of course, we worked with uh, the foreign sources also. What we did is that instead of having a single hologram, we, we on the same sensor, we basically um, uh, made multiple holograms from different points of the uh, wavefront. So we basically made the wavefront here interfere with itself. So its current condition is met. So at different points, we tried to. So we multiplex the holograms and try to increase the filter. Mm -hmm. Advantage of using uh, low current sources is that the noise is almost one fourth. I'm saying the special noise is one fourth of your quorum source. Mm -hmm. So there is no special noise, there is no parasitic interference. So the noise is very little. Thank you. More questions? Online questions? We have a comment here. Masumet, thank you for your interesting speech, but no question. <laughs> There are not more, more questions. We, we would like to thanks again you for the presentation and all of you for, for coming. Yeah. Oh, thank you all for coming. In fact, even though it was not from your field, of course, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.